Yes, uh, thank you for still sitting on the chairs. It's been a long day. Hope I can entertain you for 30 minutes. Um, I'm just arrived from a place without any technology at all. I'm just arrived from uh, Africa where I've stayed for four months uh, and where even the technology to get water out of the faucet was not working and the electricity was not working. But one thing that really worked was uh, cell phones. So uh, that was why I was in Africa to do some projects with cell phones and make uh, people make movies with them. But now I'm back and, uh, and uh, it's something very different. Uh, and I'm back here in uh, Prague, where I haven't been since uh, 95, I think. I was here very much during the 88s and 89s, just before the revolution. And uh, in, it was actually in that time I started being very interested in puppets. Um, uh, they have a big tra tradition for using uh, puppets for different things here. And uh, what we did in uh, 95 was that we go, was going with plans of making the very first computer game company in DK in Denmark. And uh, it was hard because uh, the, the engines, the, the, the 3D engines was so lousy at that time. So what we tried to do was uh, to, to look at the games like uh, uh, Mist and these kind of games who have uh, not 3D functions but was very full of, of uh, atmosphere. And what we do was we was uh, working together with some people who make puppets and they make uh, small puppets in that size and they make full size puppets and puppets in that size and we, we make a whole game just with those puppets. And it was actually the start of multimedia in, in bigger scale in Denmark. And um, we come over just by like an accident. So uh, it was where I start. It was my background. I was started out before that as a, a poet in the 80s, one part of the punk movement in the 80s, where I did poetry and I did, did prose. And, uh, and so later on, because of Prague, I get very interested in theater as well and multimedia. And uh, my background now is so the background of, of an author but also new media. And I have been there when the, the mobile phone was coming up. I do a lot of things for mobile phones. Uh, later on with the augmented reality, I start doing a lot of augmented reality. And, um, and, uh, and right now, everybody was, is running around with the clothes uh, when I, I'm doing things right now. But I still work very much for the theater and just try new technology up. For me, technology is not something strange or something that is uh, filled with, with the uh, fear or cool things or no soul or stuff like that. For me, new technology is very much a new way of talking. And as an artist, I have always been interested in any kind of new ways of expressing myself. So uh, the computer media and also the thing about robots is just the... Um, a very natural way of, of uh, go on out of that. Uh, it was like that that one of the uh, theater plays I made, <coughs> sorry, I have lost my voice, uh, was, was, um, was a, a theater group called Hotel Performa. Uh, and it's a theater group who work very much with new technology. And we did a, a theater play about a Russian musician called Leon Theramin, Theramin. And I don't know if you know the Theramin. It's, you know, the instrument you don't touch, but where you're just waving your hands in the air. And so it can say something, have a beautiful sound. And he had a very, very exciting life. And I was uh, jumping down in that. And we did these, uh, these things here. For, and I know the, the thing has always been, also been played here in, uh, in Prague. Um, but the guy I worked together with, the guy who was the researcher, researcher, was really, really a great guy, a guy called Willy Flint. And later on, he said to me, hey, uh, we should do another thing. Yeah. One of the universities in, uh, in Copenhagen, no, not in Copenhagen, in, in, uh, in, in uh, <coughs> South Denmark, they have a project they call the, 
the uh, center of art and technology, and they doing uh, technology theater. It means theater where half of the things that happen on the stage are pure technology and pure uh, science, and the other half is uh, pure fiction. So how will you think about doing something about robots? Because they have a, they have a, um, a lot of people that are working with the robot technology, and they are like uh, cutting edge in Denmark right now, so why not try to see if we could make something out of that? And, uh, and I was, of course, very interested in that, and he put me together with a guy called uh, Ben Nørgaard, and uh, he told me a little more about it. So our focus should be robots, but especially the robots that looks a lot like uh, people self. It was the time just after Isuguri was there with, with his uh, uh, robot, and uh, we have a lot of discussions uh, before we start up uh, about how we could use that on, on stage. Uh, and what we come up to was, of course, that the interesting thing is that the, the art and the science was actually asking about the same question. What is a human? I mean, how can you make a copy of a human if you don't know what a human is? So that that the hunt we always do, the, the favorite question. So uh, we, we did that. And we did it with uh, three different institutes. First, there was the Institute of uh, Technology. Uh, that was working together with the uh, Mask uh, McKinley Institute. And uh, they have these, uh, these robots, uh, they called uh, polymorphs, polymorph robots. And uh, the robot here can be totally flat and it can expand. And the next prototype they worked on could also uh, let go and connect uh, itself again. Uh, the idea was, the first one they explained me, imagine you have a big uh, closed, uh, what is it? A big closed thing you have to, to clean, but only a little hole in the top. How will you clean it? Well, we, we need to find something we can put down in the hole that can collect itself and clean it from the inside and uh, separate itself again and get up. So that was the way they started working with these polymorph uh, robots. And I think that uh, they also say they would work very much, much for these robots for, uh, for things about uh, earthquake victims. When you uh, have these uh, robots and could get them into the ruins and stabilize some of the things so you could dig into people. Because they could this by collecting itself, going out and changing size. So that was the ambition. They want very much to tell about their technology and they want very much to show that on stage. So there was another institute, okay, I will come back to that. So there was another institute, and uh, they work with uh, biology, and they try to produce a cell, a uh, fundamental, very primitive cell, but a cell to create new artificial life in a biological term. And uh, they want, they want to, uh, to, to tell about that also. And so there was the Institute for Philosophy and Religion. They uh, have a lot of uh, things about what is a human, and uh, what do we want? What what makes a human human, and what is uh, making technology technology, and all these kind of questions, as we also have discussed very much today, and uh, they were also interested. So uh, for me, it was just to try to find uh, a story to build up around that, and make these uh, persons uh, be part of it. Um, what we what we should do was. <coughs> We, we created a big uh, place where the, the actor was standing, and, and uh, it was an actor we called Thomas Bartolin. He was dressed a little like you were in the Middle Age, and a little like you are now, to tell that the question he was talking about was eternal. And so uh, he had a, a big uh, table, and uh, into that little place, all the robots was coming in. And there were also people sitting around, around him the whole way around. And some of the people was participating in the, the theater. Uh, there was uh, three real scientists. And so there was a fake scientist. And the fake scientist has the task to present a robot called Echo. 
which was not a real robot, but also a, a, an actor. And that real robot should tell what could be real in the next 10 years in robot science, and just like play that part. And so, uh, and so there was a dog also. Uh, I get the idea that uh, the opposite of humans, if that not was technology, it must be a dog. And everybody was just, oh no, no, not a dog. And uh, we, we was going to the papers and say, we're searching a, a dog to a robot uh, theater play. And it made a lot of uh, talking in the press. So everybody was very focused on, on that little thing, the dog. But we find a dog, a dog called Sif. And the whole thing started out the, where he introduced everything and he called Sif, Sif, come up here. And the dog is coming up, laying very nice. And so we have this uh, industrial robot hand where the hand goes like this and pet the dog. And so he said, does this dog know if I'm the one who petting it or the robot is petting it? And then we set off from there. And uh, everybody was, was uh, scared, but the dog behaved totally perfect the whole time. We have some troubles with the technology. That was the other thing people was afraid of. But the dog and the technology really behaved. Actually, the, the big problem was uh, was the actor and, and the, the director. Uh, the, the director get a nervous breakdown on the way and start stop working and so on. But but the humans, uh, also uh, the, the animals and the, the robots was doing well all the time. There was made a little, uh, there was made a little, <coughs> let me see, a little jingle for it. It's not telling very much about how it is, but just, a little, little thing. So, so was it. Um, how can I raise the escape button? He said a lot of things. Yep. Oops. Yeah, and that was a dark sif. What the hell going on here? And the evil was a robot. Did, did you see how the hand was going when it was? <laughs> Gee. Um, but uh, he, he, he did well, the guy who played the robot. We have put a little uh, camera under his hair. He is uh, bald, but we put a little camera here. So you can always see the view, what the bro robot was seeing. So the audience could see themselves all the time uh, doing the, the thing. And we have one day, we have one day, uh, there was uh, a woman who wants to see the show. And she was in a wheelchair, just like the robot. And she was put in, and she was unable to, to, to move at all. So she was sitting there, like that, and the robot was sitting there, like that. And she was uh, getting um, things, uh, something to drink, or, or they have a little cleaner, so they clean her every 15 minutes under the, during the thing. And everybody was totally sure that we have made that thing up. It was just putting everything in a very good context. So, um, yeah, 
But when we start working with it, uh, one of the things that I was very hooked on was uh, to, to see if we could uh, get a little contact with Stellark because uh, uh, Willy, uh, who was the researcher, I've worked a lot with Stellark before, or not a lot, but I've worked a little with him before, and I like his approach. Uh, I think you all know Stellark here, nearly. He, he is the guy who, who can write his name with three hands. One hand where you write it just like you want, and one hand somebody in the audience actually can control via a computer. And so an artificial hand, he can control himself. And he's also the guy who have uh, transplanted a copy of his own ear on his arm, and the kind of guy who swallowed a camera before it was easy to do on his own risk, he could die of it and transmit, make a transmission on the internet of the whole way from mouth to ass. And uh, he was first of all also a guy that, that shocked the whole Denmark some years ago by hanging himself up in front of the Royal Theatre in Main Square in Copenhagen in hooks. And, uh, and it was at that hook session we, uh, we had the contact with him because there was nearly all uh, who placed the hooks was the other people, so we get a connection with him. But I like his approach to see what is a body and what is, uh, what is technology and where is the limit between the two things. I think he do that very well. But, um, but uh, in, in other things we were very interested in was also to go close to the tradition of robots and puppets. And of course there was Frankenstein and Pinocchio, and also the newer one like Blade Runner was, was in our mention. But um, we were focusing very much about the dream of um, creating new life and defeat death. It was the thing we were uh, working very much in. And we have three things we worked with. It was uh, copies and relation to the copies, the interaction with the copies, and so what we call it, uh, something like appearance, what happening when they are there. That's the thing about the uncanny valley and all these kind of things. Uh, it's something about to communicate with the thing you have created and what kind of relations you have to it. So um, what we were very interested in was, of course, uh, how it could be that every time we go out and start talking at it. When, when we start talking about uh, robot music here, uh, there was this fear for how it would be. Every time people made fictions about robots and, and artificial life, it's always something about how it ends the world, uh, it destroys anything. We are very afraid of what can go on if we have these things. And we said to ourselves, yeah, okay, but why? Why are we so afraid all the time? Why is it the fear? Because, I mean, technology should just actually be, be a stable thing. It should, it should actually prevent us uh, for, for seeing the bad things. I mean, it's a way of sort it out. And uh, I, I thought very much about it when my father dad was dead uh, here some years ago, many years ago, actually. Uh, everybody left the room and was, I was alone with the body after that. And uh, I have been down in the uh, hospital in the, 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 you know, in the kiosk and buy a little one-time camera. And so I started me taking photos of him. And, uh, and he was just dead. And, and, and uh, it was just the feeling that he was not really cold yet, but starting to get colder. And so I said to myself, uh, here I am with a dead body. What if he suddenly start moving? And so I said to myself, why would I actually be afraid for that. There's something about this border. What is going on there? And that was what we really want, want to, um, to work with in, in all these. We were trying to see uh, what, what is it that will stay, stay in the middle of life and not life. In this way we have worked very much with a guy called Thomas Bartolin. Thomas Bartolin is uh, from Copenhagen in the 17 remember what, and he have this theater of death. <coughs> and I don't know if you can see what it is, but in the middle here lay a, a open lady, a lady they have, have done surgeon, uh, have, have caught up, 
there's a lot of dogs running around, as you can see. And there is, uh, there is the skin for somebody that is over there. And there's all the skeletons and so on. And it was going on in Copenhagen. You could come there and, uh, and see people being uh, caught up and being, uh, being what, what is, was inside. And it was a big thing. And uh, it was a big thing because uh, they were so, so much like living persons, but they were at the same time also deaf. So um, we, we uh, think that bartoling was a very good way to start. We were also a little fascinated about uh, this here. You know him, uh, Master Kashish. Uh, it's a guy who get, uh, get um, oh, that's a disease where you're coughing all the time, tuberculosis. Uh, he get tuberculosis and he won't, uh, don't want to, to live without uh, gi giving her body to his wife. So he make a body actually made of uh, mud where we find wood. And so he start plucking his uh, hair out and transplanted. He was uh, also the hair underneath there. And he was uh, taking his teeth out and putting into the doll. And he was taking his nails off and putting into the doll and make a very, very, very uh, copy of, of himself that he would leave to his wife when she, he was away. And I think that story was also very, very fascinating, very fascinating for me. Then, of course, we talked a little about the Lolita, the dolls, the dolls. Uh, there's a big sale thing, in, 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 uh, especially in Asia right now, um, where, where, where they are really, really much, very much like humans, and where you can, can live together with them. Uh, and talked very much about these, uh, these things, about uh, why we are uh, so upset of having a, a mirror of ourselves. And one of my uh, friends in, in Aalborg, called Henrik, was very interested in it and get a copy of, of himself. Uh, it's some pictures I took just when he come up with it, uh, because I was uh, there as a censor on the university. And he said, hey, you have to see my, the better half. And he showed me this one. Then it was made in, uh, in Japan. Uh, you can see Shiguri with the first one. And I can't remember the name of the girl with the second one, and so Henrik with the third one he had. And he said he made it make a lecture on Olpo University. And he said uh, the funny thing was that the people on the front row, they, they could see some things wrong. And the people whole way behind, but a lot of people in the middle never seen anything. And he was uh, standing there. And, uh, and, uh, and he left me with a robot for, for a, a short time, and it's like you just staring into the computer camera. And so you do like this, hello, and the robot just come up and hello. You know, and if you uh, start laughing because it's an awkward situation, the robot start laughing at you. And it's just copy, it's like a mirror all the time. And it's a very, very special thing. And it inspired me very much for my robot, Echo, uh, in the, the theater play, who, who actually just is the echo of uh, the human, it seems. So who are we seeing when we're seeing these things? We are seeing ourselves. And that, that's a very banal point, but uh, I think that's the point. And maybe we should be sure, maybe we should be frightened for that, I don't know. But I think the one who's seeing these robots here is ourselves. Yes. Um, what we do when we have to do with the robot is that we take all the, the feelings away for ourselves. We have like this pure vision of, uh, of what the human is. And that the funny thing is that we think that we, we create something that is uh, uh, unhuman. It's like we, we are very afraid for, for the shadow. We are afraid of uh, trying to, to find the, the, the nice thing but instead still stand back with, with all the things we don't want to see. So um, one of the things I've been thinking about was, now we are so afraid for these robots. What would they actually do if they ruled the world? What will they do when there was no human left? I mean, they would sit around. It's the same like the zombies. What would the zombies do when, when there was no human left? And it could be a great earth <laughs> in many ways. Yeah, but 
Then to the point, how is the time? I'm sure it's four minutes. Four minutes. Okay, it's perfect. Yes. Uh, the theatre play is, is uh, built up, as I said, uh, as a symposium. And um, and what we did with with, uh, with Echo was that we let Matt Heat make him uh, copy all these kind of uh, things. So one of the things we also do is uh, we are asking for a volunteer in the audience. And the one from the audience is coming up and uh, when they raise up their hands, he raises up their hands and they give a hug. Uh, and, and there's this kind of uh, things. And um, it was very funny because just when he was put in, we have just shown some of the other robots. And uh, I think there was going like five minutes, 10 minutes be before people knew that, oh, he's a human and not a robot like that. And then they knew it. But it was very funny because they have this insecurity. What will he do? What will he do when we start to inter interact with him? So uh, that was really funny. Um, and when I did his dialogue, I said to myself, I have made a lot of uh, things about uh, these these things, uh, experiments with uh, like Eliza and all this kind of thing. You talk with the program and you try to make it do something uh, reasonable, answer back, and you see how difficult it is to do a, a monologue or dialogue. And, and uh, one of the tricks is, of course, to put back questions. Uh, it's also a very good strategy if you, you discuss with somebody you really can't cope with, you just put out the question to him. So that's one of the things you can do. So I implanted that in the dialogue in the, uh, the thing also. But then I start to also say, okay, if I grab out some search words from, from uh, the dialogue, and so take them and search on them on, on Google, what will then come up? And what if I just say to myself, I will use that in my manuscript, and then have to write on it. And, uh, and one of it said uh, was personal and memory. And so I, Put it up on Google and go down, and I get a really, really, really juicy story about a uh, first love uh, from a, a, a lady, and I put it into like a, a little thing and put it on with this. So the whole uh, way I built up the dialogue was like uh, a random searching in the databases at the same time that it functioned as a dialogue. So uh, the, the last thing there is to say is that uh, the first part of the, the play was uh, very much to introduce a lot of these things. And in the second part after the break, I was letting, letting it go much more and, uh, and let the story take over. And I used Mac Ma Makarashi's story about I shall die and did let uh, one of the creators of the robot have the same thing. So uh, the robot we have here, I have also nails. That's real humans. Yes, um, and and my 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 final sentence is that what we tried to do when we did this was not to demonize the robots. What we tried to do was to to uh, if we demonize anything, it was our relation to the robot. And uh, I could also say that that's a thing I was thinking all the time that during the whole day. It's not always about the robots or the, the, the new technology, it's about our relation to it. That's the, that's the topic. Yes, thank you for listening. listening.